Welcome to Loving Christ, connecting God's Word to God's people one verse at a time. If you were to ask random people on the street if they thought they were going to heaven when they died and why, most of them would say yes because they think they're good people. Many false religions around the world teach that if you live a good life, you will go to whatever they consider to be heaven in the afterlife. However, the Bible teaches something completely different. In this new midweek series entitled Assurance, Being Certain of Your Salvation, Dr. Keith Zachary will teach us, using the Bible, how we can all be absolutely certain we will spend eternity with God in heaven. And here's a spoiler alert, it has nothing to do with whether or not we think we're good people. Now let's open our Bibles and prepare our hearts to receive the Word of God. And now, here's Dr. Zachary. Just looking at a number of things, Uh, for example, we've looked at how the apostles have uh, used different terms to refer to the experience of conversion. Uh, Being born again would be one. Being reconciled to God would be one. Being adopted would be one. Different terms that uh, pretty much speak to the same experience. Um, Crucified with Christ, Paul would say. Would be one. And what I want to turn my heart, heart and attention to tonight is something we've all experienced as a result of uh, God bringing us to Himself and our salvation. And that is conviction and call. It's very important that we speak to those issues because, first of all, you can't repent unless you're convicted. So when, um, when, Preachers say, as we see in uh, John the Baptist saying, repent, and Jesus saying, repent. And we'll see the term repented, uh, repent used other, in other places. It's obvious that we must repent uh, and call on the name of the Lord and believe. But repentance, which is uh, usually following, of course, conviction, is something we may be ruling out of the process today. Uh, there is a little track uh, that I hope maybe you would have time to pick up and read. We should have some copies of uh, Decisional Regeneration, uh, where basically people are making decisions without any conviction and therefore without any repentance because they don't see themselves as sinners. They just see themselves as in need of uh, Jesus to get to heaven. And that's not what salvation is all about. It's not just accept Jesus so you can go to heaven. As a matter of fact, I think I've said quite clearly before, it's really hard for me to find a place in Scripture where anyone presents that question to another, uh, even trying to read it to say that where uh, someone would say, do you want to go to heaven when you die? That's just not in Scripture. We don't find someone uh, presenting that. Do you want to go to heaven when you die? It's uh, usually... uh, People are brought to an awareness of their sinful condition and their need of rescue. And they repent as they see uh, where they are, who they are, what they are. And then they turn their faith toward the hope that is presented to them in Christ. So we uh, we therefore would see in, in Acts chapter two and just hold your place there because I'm going to I'm going to join you there in just a moment. But first, I want to remind you of what Jesus said to the disciples before he ascended into heaven. This is very important. I would imagine if anyone uh, was qualified to go and preach the gospel, it would have been the disciples who had followed Jesus for three years uh, in his earthly ministry. Certainly, and they were firsthand witnesses. John gives a wonderful testimony in First John of how that which was from the beginning we've seen, we've handled, we've Basically, we've been with Jesus, so we can tell you about Jesus. And no one would be more qualified than those disciples of Christ. But Jesus did not, and I want you to listen to this very carefully, he did not allow them to leave Jerusalem after his ascension until, let me just read it to you. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to tell you what it says. In Acts chapter 1, he says in verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And why is that verse important to this topic of 
repentance, conviction, repentance, and call. Simply because conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is not my work. I can't convict anybody. I can't really call. I can echo the gospel. But God, the Holy Spirit, is the one who's going to do what what we need or what Jesus is saying. We can be witnesses, but to have power in witness where something happens beyond us, that is the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason I bring that to, to your attention, and I want you to think very clearly about this, because I think most all of us have lived uh, through the development of a particular style of evangelism that basically outlines a plan of what we are going to do to reach people for Christ. And I'm not saying that we don't do anything. Obviously, the disciples are going to be used to echo the gospel. But if we place our faith, our confidence in our plan to reach people, then what we can do, what we can do is what we will what we will see as a result, what we can do. And that leads us to this, the basically the track that I just mentioned a moment ago, and that is decisional regeneration. So since we want to see people saved, we basically have turned from conversion to decision. And we don't count conversions, we count decisions. And so we had so many people make a decision. Now, when we talk about assurance of our salvation, I just want you to follow along with me because I think as you are really saved, you can, you can acknowledge that what I'm about to share with you has been your experience. You experienced this. So just follow along. And I'm not saying you remember my first message in this series, I said that we have our individual testimony of how we came to know Christ. All the events of our life differ, but we have to have divine proofs of our conversion, which are found in the word of God. It's the same for everyone. And that's kind of what I'm returning to tonight as I'm talking about uh, basically re- conviction, repentance, and call, and how the call is seen in those two things, conviction and repentance. So what Jesus is saying to the disciples is, basically, you can't go out and share anything until after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Because it's not just the information that you have, though that's what people need, your testimony, and they need the gospel. But this is not going to be done without the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just give you one other verse of Scripture before I join you in Acts 2, because I want to see basically how it happened in Acts 2 and other places. But in John's Gospel, chapter 16, we find Jesus telling the disciples about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 13 of chapter 16 of John's Gospel, He says, however, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. So you need the spirit of God to know what you should know and then have the authority to speak what you know and to tell people the gospel. Now, that's what's going to happen for you when the spirit comes. He will guide you. He will teach you. Have you ever thought about the message that uh, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost? I mean, it was scripture. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Uh, He didn't actually go and study for the sermon, but the Spirit of God came upon him. And when he was filled with the Spirit and what people saw, he said, this is the fulfillment of Scripture because the Spirit of God was going to guide them, lead them. And I'm 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 not a proponent of not being prepared. I'm just saying on that particular occasion when the Spirit of God came upon the disciples, we see exactly what Jesus says. The Spirit is guiding them. He speaks uh, on his own authority, and whatever he speaks, uh, he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me. That's in 13 and 14. But look back and see what the, Spirit has got, what the Spirit of God is going to do to other people. So here you are, the spokesperson, the disciple. What happens? He's going to come upon you. He'll guide you into truth. Uh, he'll allow you to speak not, not of his own authority, but there will be an authority that comes forth. He'll speak what he hears, and he'll tell you things to come. He'll glorify Jesus. What's going to happen to the recipients of these messages as the Spirit uses the church and leads the church in preaching the Word of God? Here's what it says. So he says, nevertheless, verse 7, 
I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So when the Spirit comes... He's going to come upon you and lead you and guide you in truth. You're going to speak the truth. His authority will be uh, clearly obvious as he uses you to speak the word of God. But it's going to speak the word of God to people, and they're going to be convicted of sin, of their lack of righteousness. Maybe they'll be convicted of their self-righteousness, which is what Paul said concerning Israel. Brother, in my heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved, but they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, have gone about to establish their own righteousness. And so God's going to set the record straight on righteousness. It's not yours. You don't have any. So conviction is going to come upon the hearts of people, the word of righteousness, because here's the evidence that Christ was righteous. He resurrected. This is in Peter's message on uh, the day of Pentecost. And then of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And so uh, God's going to have the last say, and he's going to do what he's going to do. But he's going to use the church, and the Spirit of God's going to empower the church. So what I'm trying to say to you, just to get to the points that I want to present tonight, and that is uh, that we have to have conviction, that we may have repentance, that we may acknowledge the call of God in our life. So uh, we've all lived, as I said, through the time period where we've seen a transition and we're not, number one, we see a lot of preaching that uh, we don't think that people are dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit to convey the message. Uh, a lot of uh, preaching that is much more man-centered, uh, a lot of preaching that just is not preaching, just to be quite honest. But there's some result, which really scares me, that people are getting saved and nothing's really being said that convicts them of sin. Nothing's being said that causes them to come to see the need of repentance. Nothing's being said. It's just making a decision and going on. And like I said, even uh, we have many in our own denomination that do have record of report of the decisions made. And the result is we, of course, find so many of those people uh, are not Christians. They don't live like Christians, and really it's hard to find them in any congregation over a certain period of time. It was just something that they were manipulated into, that they were convinced they needed to do. Maybe they followed other people in a gathering. So we say a lot about let's try to have a real large crowd, sometimes real large crowds, three people in a group that's gathered there. If three people go forward, maybe 10 people go forward following their friends. I don't know. But I'm just saying that the point that I'm trying to make is Jesus said, even to disciples who had something to say, you cannot say anything until the Holy Spirit has come upon you, because only then will there be conviction. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And also, then there will be repentance, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. And then there will be conversion, which again is the work of the Holy Spirit. So let's just say, for example, tonight, before we look at Acts 2 and see what what happened on the day of Pentecost, let's say tonight we want to see people saved in Denham Springs. How are we going to get people saved? Well, that's a very interesting question. And I can tell you, we are not going to get people saved. The real question is, when are we going to come to the point where we realize unless we are filled with the Spirit of God, we can't be used of God to really preach the Word of God and see the work of God So what does it really turn our attention back to as a church? Our need to become useful vessels 
in the hands of God by being filled with the Spirit of God and depending totally upon the Spirit of God to touch the hearts of people and draw them to Jesus. You can only do so much in your flesh. And this is what Augustine said about what you can do in the flesh. If you do it in the flesh, it can be, he said, it can be splendid sin. Rather unusual term, because you're depending upon yourself and not on God. And Jesus would not let his disciples do that. But after the Holy Spirit has come upon them. So we see now in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God has come upon the disciples. Uh, let's just read it in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. How many of you have been in any congregation where there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind? No one? Have you ever met anyone that's been in a congregation where there was a rushing mighty wind? I'm going to tell you how to read your Bible. I want you to understand that many things that happen in Acts, the history of the apostles, are transitional things. They're going to happen one time and never happen again. Why? Because this is a transition from the time of the disciples following Jesus to being filled with the Spirit to passing on the work of the ministry to the church, basically. And so in order to acknowledge them as powerful men of God in the leadership of the church, some things are going to happen. I don't walk by anybody and my shadow causes them to be healed. I don't, I mean, we're just seeing some things. I can't go up to people and say, I don't have much silver or gold, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. I, I mean, these things happen, but we don't see this happening over and over and over again in the church. Paul says to Timothy, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. He didn't say, I'll send you a prayer cloth. So what we have to understand is some things are happening in Acts for the, for the first time and maybe the only time. So there's not rushing mighty wind experiences because the Spirit of God came upon the church once. It was the day that the church was birthed as the Spirit came upon the church and as the disciples were filled with the Spirit so that they could be used of God to preach the gospel with power. So the Bible says in verse 4, well, let's read verse 3. And then there appeared unto them divided tongues as a fire, and, and, on, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Okay, and again, I'm saying just as much as we don't see, uh, we've never been in an experience of a mighty wind coming into the house that we're sitting or the building that we're sitting. Neither do we see cloven tongues as a fire sit, coming upon people, on all the people present, and they're all filled with the Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Just saying that didn't happen again like that. This is the birth of the church, and this is the empowering of the apostles. So if you ever have anyone ask you, have you ever been filled with the Holy Spirit and speak with tongues? Have you ever had that experience? And uh, they're trying to get you to have that experience. You have to understand that the disciples, number one, didn't expect that. They weren't looking for that. They weren't asking for that. They didn't seek that. It's what happened by the will of God for the purpose of empowering the disciples to go forth in the spirit and preach the word of God. Why did they speak in tongues? They spoke in tongues so that they would have the language barrier broken and they would be able to go out and be the witnesses that they were empowered to be to, to people without a language, without having a language barrier. Well, we know that because the Bible says that, um, let's just read on, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews devout men from where? From every nation under heaven. So the tongues that they're speaking that we're about to read of are tongues of people from different places. And with this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Some people have said the miracle was on the hearing, but no, the Bible says it's in the speaking, that they were speaking in the language of the people. Verse 7, and they were all amazed and marveled, said one to another, look, are not all these Galileans, which was not a compliment. It was basically uh, these people aren't really well known for being so educated as to know all of these languages that they're speaking. How is it that we hear every man in our own language wherein we were born? 
Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwelling in dwellers are those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Bigra, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So here they're empowered by the Spirit of God, not only to speak the Word of God, but to break the language barrier and speak it in many different languages so that people knew something was going on that was beyond their ability. That's the point. We need the Spirit of God to do His work. The Bible says in verse 13, others were mocking, said these people are full of new wine, another way of saying these people are drunk. Verse 15 makes that clear. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. Why? Why would they say they're drunk? Matter of fact, how could they say they're drunk? I've never met a person that could speak a different language as a result of being drunk. I think I'm going to go out and get drunk so I can speak German. That makes no sense at all. <laughs> I can't speak Spanish when I go, go to South America, but I'm not going to get drunk so I can talk to the people. It just meant, well, that's the craziest accusation ever, but they answer it still, and they said, no, this, that's not what's happening here. In verse, uh, well, let's just read Peter's uh, response. Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. What a wonderful pinpoint accurate word for the moment. Where do you think that comes from? Peter is so smart. Look, he hasn't said anything really smart to this point that we can say he's always opening his mouth with such wisdom. No, usually he's not. But at this point, he's pinpoint accurate as to this is that which is spoken by Joel. And we believe, of course, this is another evidence of his being filled with the Spirit. Right then at that moment, saying what needed to be said, and this is the Spirit leading him and empowering him to preach the Word of God, the written Word of God. Verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out of my Spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I shall wonders. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved. Now, if I were to preach that to you, if I were to just preach those words from Joel, And I said, this is what God says, and it says, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is that a time for me to give an invitation? I mean, would you come as I just explained that we're going to have people speaking in tongues in the last days? We're going to have people having visions and dreaming dreams, and and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Doesn't seem to be a place to give an invitation, does it? I mean, have I preached the gospel? I've preached the word. I think one thing that's very clear here. And the way the Spirit, not Peter, but the Spirit is leading Peter to preach, is that the Word of God is going forth in such a way as to verify what he's about to say about Jesus, in the sense that the Old Testament, which many of them there, Jews devout men, mind you, out of every nation under heaven, people who've come together with religious minds, will be greatly interested in hearing this scripture and how it's connected to this event. And when a person can say, this is that, wow, you have my undivided attention. So in other words, Peter, being used of the Spirit of God, being guided by the Spirit of God in the truth, has just captivated the congregation by presenting the Word of God in such a fashion that people now have their antennas up and they're listening. If he had not given this type of explanation, To these devout men out of every nation under heaven, he may not have had the opportunity to share with them something that they're going to have a little bit of trouble with at the beginning because it has to do with their sin. But if you can pretty much share the word of God in 
I would say in their experience in, uh, in, uh, how shall I put this? Let's see. Share it in context with, um, where people, for these people, these religious people, where they live, he pretty much is bringing something that is applicable to the moment, to their attention, but at the same time, he really has their attention by quoting an authority, the source, the Word of God. So he's not saying, I believe, I think. He's saying, this is that which God said. Now, since God said, and I know this is what God said, the men are now listening, which leads me to say, that the Spirit of God leads us not to say what we think, not to say what we want, but to say what God says. So that's now he has their attention saying this is what God says about this moment. Then he goes on to speak to the men of Israel, and here's he's going to bring his message, the gospel, basically. Hear these words. Men of Israel, hear these words. You willingly heard those words because you recognize them as a prophecy of the Old Testament an authority you acknowledge. Now that I have your undivided attention, men, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Well, that's a mighty point right there. And the reason that we know that that's a mighty point is because we kind of know the cover-up that was so clearly exposed when Nicodemus went to Jesus. Nicodemus was a ruler, a teacher in Israel. And he said, uh, he said to Jesus, we know that you are a man come from God because no man can do the things that you're doing unless God is with him. Nicodemus is, is telling Jesus, we're not telling the truth to people. We know you came from God because we see what you're doing. Exactly what Peter's saying here. You know that Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested by God to you by miracles. Nicodemus knew that, and he exposed that truth when he came to Jesus, John chapter 3. And then he says, "Him, but here's what you do. Here's what you did. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God. Isn't that comforting? You have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. So while here's their sin, here's their problem, now he's pointing out to these devout men that there is a sin that you need to see. You are not people who favor God and love God. You took the one sent by God and crucified him. But the comforting thing to them, at least it may be after they're saved, is that this happened by the purpose and foreknowledge of God. So basically, I think that may be how we can see many things in Scripture. It happens. We don't understand why it happens, but we see that it happens according to the will of God. I was just reading this week uh, in the Old Testament how that uh, Samson was doing some things that all had to do with his assignment in life, but he didn't know it, and, and his parents definitely couldn't see it. But it was all in the will of God. You can go read Samson's story. You can see it says it plainly that this was in the will of God. This is what God wanted to happen to lead him to what he was born to do. Here, it's the same thing. Now that I have your attention, I'm going to talk to you about Jesus. This is the way we present the gospel in the Spirit of God Uh, We're being led to present truth and truth and truth. And so he goes back to the Old Testament. He talks about Jesus. He talks about who he was. And then he talks about sin, what you did. And then he says, him being delivered up by the term and purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. But God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And then he quotes scripture again. Again, this is just an amazing thing. The Spirit of God is just coming up on Peter to quote the Word of God like he he had been studying for this sermon. And he says, David, concerning David, scripture, verse 25, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. 
Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also rests in hope for you will not leave my soul in Hades. This is talking about Jesus. Nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Another scripture. I think, if I can say anything definitively tonight, when we're preaching the word of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, scripture is going to be very well presented in that message. Go back to the Old Testament, Old Testament, now that I have your attention again. Verse 29, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of whom or of which, rather, we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having been received from the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. And another scripture, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. That's just, isn't that incredible? The Spirit of God is showing us that God is going to take the Word of God and speak directly to the current situation, where we are, to people's heart, where they are right now. He's going to use Scripture to back up and and to support all that he's saying. And again and again, he does that, and Peter does that. Then he says, and this is bringing his Scripture to the close, or his message to the close, if we were doing some type of presentation of how you preach a message, he says in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, what happened to them? They were cut to the heart. I'm going to tell you, Peter couldn't do that. That's God taking the word, the word, the word off the page and putting it in their face and dealing with their sin. And when they knew that God had done that, they were cut to the heart. And I'm going to tell you, that's exactly what happened to you. At some point in your life, you realize God had your number. And it was so clear. And you realize that God was speaking to you. And you realize that you were a sinner. And you realize that there was no hope. And conviction began to just overwhelm you. It was just overwhelming. I remember reading of days in Spurgeon. Spurgeon would have people have their soul. I think the the term that he used was anxiousness of soul. And they would come and they would say, help me, help me. Because they realized that they were sinners in need of salvation. And many times Spurgeon said, you need you need God. You don't need me. You need God. He would turn them to the Lord because he knew he wasn't the answer to the anxiety that was now taking them over. But the Lord who was convicting them would bring them to peace and to salvation. The Lord would just deal with God. I've so many times uh, learning from the lesson of Spurgeon. I've had many times in the past dealing with people and I could not stay with them until they came to salvation because there was no, no way I knew when that would happen. So we would talk for hours. And then I would say, look, I'm going to turn you over to the Lord. You go home and you pray. And they would stay up at night and maybe call me at one or two o'clock in the morning and say, I just was saved. And I would say, praise God. It's salvation is of the Lord. I didn't need to be there, but you needed to be where you were just anxious about your soul before God. That's a, that's, that may not be a comfort, comfortable place to be, but that is a safe place to be, being anxious about your soul before the Lord. So these people are cut to the heart. And then Peter just begins to tell them that this is what's happened. This is what you did. And then they cut to the heart, say to Peter, what shall we do? I love that question. 
Not that I'm going to tell you what to do before you ask, but when you ask, I have an answer. So let's let's just stop a, a moment and back away from that and talk about preaching today. So we're going to have a desire. We have a desire for people to be saved. What can we do to get people to come here? Wrong question. Wrong question. Let's get on our our face and cry out to God and say, God, you have put your light in us. Draw people to hear the message. Bring us to them or bring them to us. But Lord God, it's all your work. I mean, what if I got, I'm going to tell them some people, I guess. Here. What if I got a helicopter at Easter and we dropped 50,000 plastic eggs out in the parking lot? Are you kidding me? Oh, people might come to see such a thing. But we don't play games like that. We get on our face and say, God, you're introducing us to people every day. I don't have to have people come in this room to present the gospel to them. Guess what? I have people going out with the gospel in their heart. I just pray God send people you and send you to people. And this is how we go out and share the gospel. I pray that you'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray that you will be knowledgeable of the Word of God, led by the Spirit of God to know the Scriptures so that when you have opportunity, you haven't prepared a canned presentation, but God can call a Scripture just to your mind to use for that moment, at that time, for that person in that person's life. This is how we should be preaching the gospel. And if we talk about the assurance of our salvation, then certainly we remember that we heard the gospel. Certainly uh, we didn't need someone to just give us a decisional equation so that we could get on with living beyond our anxiousness of soul. We needed someone to share the word of God with us to the point that we were convicted and overwhelmed with conviction. And then we had nothing more to do than say, what shall we do? And that's a good place to be where you're asking the question. I'm not just giving the answer. Let me ask you. How, and again, I'm not. I have to be careful how I present this. I think people do things with good intentions, but I think good intentions can still be sinful and what what's done can be wrong. But if I were to come up to you and I were to just ask you, and this is my presentation, it's canned, I've memorized it, I already have it done down in my mind. I know what I'm going to say before you say anything in answer to my question. So really, I'm just waiting for you to stop talking so I can continue my presentation. I'm kind of like a... I'm like a salesman, really. Got it all in my head. So I ask you the question. If you were to die today, you were standing before God, and God said, why should I let you in my heaven? What would your answer be? It's a good question. It's okay. We're kind of wading into it. But it's a canned presentation. And number one, we're assuming, first of all, that the person believes there is a God. We're assuming, secondly, that the person believes there is a heaven. And the other place, we're assuming. But what I'm trying to say about assurance, when we were saved and when we try to present the gospel to people, we're not really concerned about heaven and hell at the moment. What we're more concerned about is do they know God? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father he didn't say cometh unto heaven. He said comes unto the Father, but by me. And coming unto the Father is not something hereafter. It's something here and now. Our problem in our world is we don't know God. And so the question shouldn't be if you die today and you were to stand before God, God, who's God? It's the wrong place to start. So the question has to be more something that you feel at the moment you should ask that is relevant to the fact that these people that you're talking to do not know God, and that's their major problem. And the obstacle to their knowing God is sin. That's what stands between them and God. And if you can get to that point, I think we're preaching the gospel the way we should. You say, well, this is, isn't this message more about assurance? Yeah, it absolutely is. And so I want to sh share with you just tonight as we're going to come to a close, I have much more to say about this because I want to show you some examples of Peter preaching the gospel again and Paul 
being uh, confronted with his condition in need of salvation. Uh, I'm going to show you how Peter's preaching the gospel in the house of Cornelius, and he's not He's, he's just preaching. He's just telling about Jesus. And all of a sudden, people are filled with the Spirit. Like they jump from hearing the gospel to being saved and being filled with the Spirit all at the same time. It's like, how did that happen? More proof that we're not in control. We're depending on the Spirit of God to lead us and guide us. But in this text tonight, just so that you might know, number one, listen carefully. We have the gospel, but we need the Holy Spirit to convey it. Number two, In conveying the gospel, we need to be scripturally accurate and we need to be have our minds saturated with the scripture so that we can have what we need at the moment to bring it to the people's attention that the word says, the word says, God says, God says. It's very important. Number three, at some point, this is very important. Listen, in the very next couple of chapters, we didn't we didn't get to it tonight, but I'll show you. Not everyone who hears the gospel is going to be convicted. And if they're not convicted, you need to leave it alone and not try to pressure them to make a decision that could be something that they that they think is their salvation. And it's really not. It's no salvation, no conversion. So what we do is we we depend on the spirit of God to lead us, to guide us, to give us the word of God. We understand uh, that we need to be presenting scripture to people. We present the gospel in clarity that Jesus Christ is their only hope and that they are sinners. And they're just as guilty of the death of Christ because Christ died for sin as these people uh, Peter's talking to here. Now, I will say that Peter gives them this one word after they say, what shall we do? This is what Peter says to them. Peter said to them, repent. Why? Why do you say that? Because he recognized conviction. Conviction came when they sensed this overwhelming sense of guilt and that they're condemned. And when that came upon them and they said, what shall we do? That's when we say repent. So conviction is by the Holy Spirit and repentance is a message of hope. You cry out to God and repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. Need to be a lot. The nature of repentance is not just being sorry. Repentance is turning from and turning to, turning away from and turning to. So we're telling them to turn from their attitude toward Christ, their sin, their attitude toward God. Turn to God and look to Christ uh, with a um, a hope and a faith in Jesus and His crucifixion. So when He said, "Repent." And let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. There's a lot to be said about that. But basically the baptism that that becomes the Christian baptism is a symbol of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And the baptism that is the baptism that everyone has is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what he's talking about, that they, that, that they would be baptized by someone, but he's saying you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, recognizing that it is his death, burial, and resurrection that deals with your sin. And you shall then receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if he was talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, which is being brought into a union with Jesus, that's something that requires more, I guess, more information than we find here. So. We must assume that he's talking about baptism to speak of how sins are removed, and that would be more of a recognition of the symbolism of the gospel in baptism. For the promises to you and to your children and to all are far off, as many as shall call from the name of the Lord, or as many as the Lord will call. So it's the call of God again. So let me put things in context, and, and if you can remember it for next week, we'll pick up here. So number one, we have the gospel, the word being presented by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's scriptural, it's scriptural, it's scriptural. It presents Jesus and what he did on the cross. The gospel's fully presented. As it's presented, you wait. It's the Spirit's work from that point. You've done what the Spirit leads you to do. And then conviction comes upon the heart of the person. When they say, what shall I do? You're ready to take them to the next point. You tell them to repent of their sins, place their faith in the finished works of Christ, and then they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Don't leave the gift of the Holy Spirit out. So let me ask you about your salvation experience. I'll bring more to your attention here next week. When you were saved, and I really want to hear your testimony sometime. Will you tell me how you were saved? I want to hear that. When you were saved, just first of all, I just want to ask you, were you convicted of sin? Did you know that you were not where you needed to be with God and you saw no hope outside of what was presented to you in the gospel, Jesus Christ? No hope, whatever. Number two, were you told at that time to trust Jesus, not to trust your prayer that you might pray, not to trust your feelings, but to trust completely in the finished works of Christ? And did you trust in the finished works of Christ? So before you trusted Christ, you repented of the sins that you were that you were aware of in your life, the sinfulness of being out uh, of fellowship with God, of being an enemy of God, or being one worthy of God's judgment. You repented of the sin that brought you to that place, and you asked God for forgiveness, and you trusted Christ. Now, let me just tell you this. To talk about assurance. Now, I've been talking a lot tonight about how we share the gospel and what we do, but I'm just also at the same time bringing out assurance. Listen to me carefully. If for some reason you're not confident of your conversion, if for some reason that's you, then here's what I want you to do I want you to pray and ask God to either bring you to an absolute awareness of your lostness so you can feel the conviction you need to feel or bring you to an absolute awareness of your assurance, one or the other. And if that's your heart's cry, you're going to go one direction or the other. You say, well, I don't remember this. I don't remember that. I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you, If you just can't get it settled that you repented of your sins, you were convicted, you repented of your sins and trusted Christ. I don't know why that's pretty simple, but if that's not where you are, then I want you to pray that God gives you the conviction that you need by allowing you to know for certain that you're not saved. And I fear in our country especially, we've had so many people grow up in churches Religious, they did things in by instruction of preachers, but they've never really been converted. And really, they've never been convicted. And they've never repented of the sin that has kept them from God. So I'm going to leave that with you. And next, next Wednesday, I want to just share with you how Peter preached and how Paul came to his conversion experience. And I just want to compare all of that so that you can see through the Acts of the Apostles some very important uh, examples. And I would believe that wherever you are, if you're not sure, I believe that can be resolved tonight. It's not something you have to wait tonight. And for the rest of us who already know for sure we're saved, let's be careful about how we present the gospel and presented accurately, trusting the Spirit of God to do His work. And let's not step over that bounds boundary and try to do God's work for Him. Let's to believe that He'll do His own work and trust the Spirit to lead us. So I want to pray tonight for two or three things. Number one, that we all would be filled with the Holy Spirit every day of our life, controlled by the Spirit and be being controlled by the Spirit every day of our life. That we would have a heart for people to be saved and pray that our churches would be empowered and used of God to share the gospel and pray for those in our churches who really aren't saved, that they would be awakened to their need of Christ. So pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that speaks so clearly to us about the need of the Holy Spirit to be able to function and work in the ministry, to be able to even share the gospel with people so that they might hear it the way they should. And Father, I pray that you would forgive any uh, of our involvement in activity that did not have an absolute confidence in the Spirit of God to do what must be done. 
and sharing the good news of Jesus. So, Father, help us to pray for lost people now and to pray for our hearts to be in tune with the Spirit to speak words. And may we never have confidence in ourselves, but always depend on the Spirit of God to use us to speak to people who need Jesus. And, Father, for those in our congregations who are really lost and they've just made a a decision, and even then there was no concern except going to heaven. That's all that they had a concern about. So today they do not walk with God. They do not know God. They do not understand Scripture. They do not have praise in their heart. Lord God, I pray that you convict them of their need. May it be an overwhelming experience of conviction that they might have repentance in their heart, cry out to Christ for salvation. So stir them and awaken them to that truth. And Father, may we now be uh, very careful to read the scripture, Father, as we look into more examples of people preaching under the anointing of the Spirit and what you did and how you work. So God is from this place to be excited about what we are going to hear, but to make use of what we've heard for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to Loving Christ, the media ministry of New Covenant Church of Denham Springs, Louisiana. If we can minister to you somehow, please call us at area code 225-664-0858. Until next time, get into the Word of God and stay there. This has been a production of New Covenant Church, all rights reserved.